All right. Well, hello and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the latest in our 2015 webinar series, where we will focus today on off-grid energy solutions and the role of services in driving adoption. We developed this webinar in collaboration with Nakul Karaba of S3 IDF and Leslie Marincola of Angada. My name is Jan Aranda, and I will be one of the moderators for today's webinar, along with Gaurav Manchanda of One Degree Solar. When I'm not doing this, I work with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and E4C as the Director of Program. Now I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar. One of the global goals for sustainable development is affordable and clean energy. Yet globally, over 1.2 billion people still lack access to an electricity grid. More than 95% of them live in sub-Saharan Africa or developing countries in Asia, and 84% are in rural areas, according to the International Energy Agency. Furthermore, off-grid consumers face an economic penalty for this inequality. In East Africa alone, a typical family can spend up to 20% of their annual income on lighting and cell phone charging. While governments and large NGOs are working to improve energy access, social enterprises have become an important player in lighting up dark homes. To tell you more about this, we've invited two social entrepreneurs in this field, Nakul Kadaba of S3IDF, which stands for Small Scale Sustainable Infrastructure Development Fund, and Leslie Marincola of Angaza. They are joined by a fellow colleague, Gaurav Manchanda of One Degree Solar, uh, as today's moderator. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series. Along with myself, we have Michael Mader of E4C and ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, and Jackie Halliday of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Oh, apologies there. There we go. <clears throat> Before we move on to our presenters, we thought it would be a good idea to tell you about E4C and who we are. E4C is a knowledge hub and global community of nearly 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. These can include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy solutions, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides class-free access to practical and current news, professional development resources, and a growing inventory of field-tested solutions. E4C members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with our site, the better we will be able to serve you content that meets your needs and interests. We invite you to join E4C's passionate global community and contribute to making people's lives better all across the world. Please check out our website, www.engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. Now, the webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. The webinar series is a free, publicly available series of online seminars showcasing best practices and thinking of development practitioners in the field. Information on the upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars page, and the webinar uh, URL is listed there. If you're following us on Twitter, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. And you're also able to access all of the recordings on our YouTube channel and with the URL listed on the slide. Our next webinar will be on October 21st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and our topic will be the role of standards in global development. Uh, apologies, the role of standards in sustainable energy for all. Check out the E4C webinars page for updates on our speakers and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, we will be sending an invitation to the webinar directly. Now then, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see first where everyone is from today. In the chat window, which is located to the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. 
If the chat is not open on your scheme, you can access it by clicking the chat icon on the top right corner of the screen. So I'll go ahead and get us started. And I'm entering our information here. Hello to everybody from New York. And I see we have a lot of folks from around the United States. We have New Jersey, California. Also internationally, we have folks joining us from India. I see South Africa. Welcome, everybody. It's, it's a pleasure to see all of you from all across the world. Now, any technical questions or administrative problems should go into this chat window. Feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin if you have any issues as well. You can also use the chat window to type in any remarks you may have for the audience or the speakers. However, during the webinar, please use the Q&A window located directly below the chat to type in your questions for the presenters. Again, if you don't see this, you can access it by clicking the icon in the top right-hand corner. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. Now, following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour PDH for this session, please follow the instructions at the top of the E4C webinars page. And the listed webinar URL is right there. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Gaurav Manchanda, who is the CEO of One Degree Solar. The company has investors, clients, and partnerships with Schneider Electric, Coca-Cola, IFC, the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association, and the United Nations Foundation. Previously, Gaurav spent years in post-conflict Liberia as an advisor to the Deputy Ministry of Health, a position sponsored by the Clinton Foundation. In this role, he secured $10 million in emergency funding from the World Bank and led initiatives that provide solar energy and electronic information systems to off-grid health clinics. Additionally, Garaf has advised the Liberian Rural and Renewable Energy Agency and made publications for the USAID Powering Health Initiative. We're very excited to have Garaf join us today, and I'll hand it over to him to introduce our speakers. I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Nicole uh, for, uh, for his session. And uh, but before I do, I'll, I'll say that the, the Q&A uh, window is open, so please share your questions there, and we'll address all the questions at the end of uh, the presentations. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Gaurav, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Um, thanks a lot also to Engineering for Change uh, for this opportunity. We're really happy as S3IDF to talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing and kind of share some of our um, insights to everyone else and hopefully you know we can get some kind of conversation during the webinar and then afterwards as well uh, for hopefully some collaboration uh, and I believe I have control of the slides so great uh, so S3IDF uh, which um, is, is a nonprofit uh, based in both Cambridge Massachusetts the US as well as uh, Bangalore India and we have a mission to build inclusive market systems uh, through small-scale enterprises. Um, we also have an inherent desire to spread the values of our approach and our, the way we do um, you know, enterprise development to influence other organizations, that being you know, donors, uh, implementing organizations, investors, and um, you know, product companies, and the others include product companies and financial institutions. And, other organizations that we work with on the ground to apply either the full or parts of our approach in their work. Um, we have an emphasis on creating you know, access to clean energy technologies for the poor and poor entrepreneurs to benefit the communities they work in, as well as create uh, job opportunities, uh, less, dependencies, less dependency on uh, fossil fuels, um, and create uh, opportunities to earn income. Uh, we have, as Gaurav kind of highlighted, we have an active project portfolio in India, uh, over 150 projects. Um, in addition to that, we are currently conducting you know, market assessments to expand our work into Cambodia and Myanmar, um, which we can definitely talk about uh, offline if people are interested in those geographies. And um, more pertinent to India, we currently host the Clean Energy Access Network, or CLEAN, which is uh, based in New Delhi, uh, and it's actually a collection of clean, decentralized clean energy uh, practitioners um, addressing the challenges they face in um,
creating energy access for the poor um, all across the country. Um, so the approach that we use is called the Social Merchant Bank Approach, or the SMBA, and that's uh, the, the acronym that I'll use from, from now on. Um, and the SMBA uh, is based on a, a lot of years and uh, a lot of years of you know our colleagues and partner organizations that we worked with who realized that um, we needed to bundle several services together to provide poor entrepreneurs the necessary resources they could uh, they needed in order to um, make the partnerships um, start their enterprises and uh, scale as they needed to on their own time. Um, so as you can see, it is, um, and, and hopefully it's uh, visible to everybody um, on the webinar, but it's three bundled services addressing the financing, the technology, and the business development, uh, or the capacity building uh, sides of constructing a small-scale enterprise. Um, our first one is leverage co-financing, where we bring in um, you know, commercial, local financial institutions. Now, these can be uh, MFIs. These can be, you know, commercial banks. Uh, they can be crowdfunding platforms. Uh, it just depends on the community that we're working with, the entrepreneur that we're working with, and, you know, the financing constraints that they uh, realize at the time. And what we do is we use um, grant funding to create revolving funds um, and host them within these institutions to um, stimulate uh, different types of debt conditioning instruments that the entrepreneurs themselves can uh, take advantage of to use for constructing their enterprises, um, i.e., you know, acquiring different technologies, uh, different clean energy technologies that they may need, um, setting up, you know, other setup costs that may be relevant um, in terms of, you know, hiring, um, and so on and so forth. Um, we also, in this time, create uh, technology buyback agreements uh, with product companies that we put in touch with our poor entrepreneurs so that the entrepreneurs are not just uh, included in the supply chain for uh, with the financial institution, but also with uh, a company that is going to be providing them with those critical products uh, so that they are creating relationships on two fronts. Um, good segue into kind of the next part of our approach, uh, the technology access and knowledge. Um, we S3IDF develops and integrates uh, technology options that are appropriate for the poor, uh, adapting, adapting off-the-shelf technology, um, communicating with different technology companies that can provide uh, products um, at cost, but what normal consumers, um, such as you know, all of us, can, can get so that it meets the needs of the poor and uh, it can be provided at an affordable cost to the poor. And through this time, we also work with uh, the entrepreneurs to make sure that, uh, you know, they are getting the kind of the relevant right products to, uh, uh, to sell uh, based on, you know, what the demand is. Um, and, you know, kind of added on to that, we work all along kind of the supply chains and the tech, uh, with, with relative technologies uh, so that, you know, it includes, you know, linked productive use applications. So sometimes, um, you know, while we're not, if we're not, you know, granting, you know, pure, just pure energy access, um, maybe it can be something like uh, agricultural machinery uh, that a poor community needs access to. s 3 idf will work with, you know, and identify um, a product company to work with that entrepreneur, link them up, you know, do the same process again, find the financing, help um, the entrepreneur provide uh, or get access to that, uh, to all the resources that they need. And finally, the last um, kind of the last part of our approach is our business development support that we provide. Where you know we sit down with the entrepreneur, we make sure that uh, you know we understand, um, you know, we work out a viable you know scale model uh, that they can use to you know sell their product, um, hire more people from the community, from the poor community themselves, um, you know, expand wherever they want to, um, providing you know hands hands-on, you know, training in a, in a formal setting, in a more informal setting, uh, more mentoring uh, on a case-by-case -case basis so that they are able to use us as a resource long after, you know, our formal engagement, so to speak, has been, um, you know, has, has been completed. Um, now, the purpose of this, again, was because of the fact that there were so many gaps that we had 
seen in India where one organization may provide just the financing, one organization may buy, just provide the technological innovation, um, one organization may just provide the capacity building. We, as 3 rdf had this uh, belief in combining all three of those, um, you know, utilizing different amounts depending on the entrepreneur's knowledge, depending on the landscape, uh, depending on, you know, the types of technologies needed uh, so that it remains, so the SMBA as a result remains a very flexible uh, approach that can be uh, provided, you know, not just in India, but in other uh, geographies as well. Um, I won't go through, you know, I won't read off uh, the investment criteria, but on the left side is kind of the investment criteria that S3 IDF uses uh, before deploying, you know, funds from our revolving fund to set up um, small-scale enterprises that meet, you know, the needs. And similar to what um, uh, to what I was stating before with our leveraged co-financing, we believe in the concept of blended um, blended capital structures to construct these enterprises because they are um, being used with poor entrepreneurs. The poor there is this ability, and we've seen in our case in India that the poor do not have access to formal uh, financial institutions, or um, you know they do not have access to get the products um, such as you know LED lights, CFL lights, um, or if we're using kind of small micro or pico hydro systems. Um, so through this, you know, using a blended capital structure, uh, we're able to create financing deals that integrates not only our funds from our, not only our capital from the revolving fund, but also funds that the entrepreneur may be able to provide, uh, sweat or uh, hard equity, um, in order to, you know, bring about a deal and bring about a relationship with the financial institution. Um, and through that, it, uh, it you know, kind of provides everyone's uh, quote-unquote skin in the game, where everyone has an incentive to make sure that this enterprise or this project goes off well, uh, including the entrepreneur. Um, there's, you know, we, uh, as, as stated before, we go over the um, kind of the terms of the loan or the terms of whatever relationship has, uh, is uh, between the financial institution and the, um, the entrepreneur to make sure that, you know, uh, the estimated monthly installments are being paid on time uh, because that relationship uh, will will stand far longer and um, after we've left and uh, it's our intention that it, it remains like that. Um, Uh, kind of brings us to some more kind of challenges and you know insights that we've seen in the Indian context. Um, a general belief that S3 IDF finds is uh, there's not enough donor capital to solve poverty on its own, uh, and in and in this case, you know, providing uh, or fulfilling the goals related to uh, energy, energy providing energy access to um, uh, all those you know across the developing world. However. S3IDF does believe and can use this funding to act as catalyzing instruments to unlock local private sector financing. And, you know, again, uh, listed, you know, several, uh, several examples there. Um, the key in the SMBA, again, to reiterate, is that careful intermediation and technical assistance is really required, um, really understanding the local geographies that you work in. India is uh, such a vast geography. What may be prevalent in a project site in Karnataka may not be prevalent or relevant in Telangana, for example. Uh, similarly, what may be relevant in an urban site uh, in India may not be relevant in a rural site. Um, so caref that careful kind of inspection and that careful, you know, identification of entrepreneurs is really necessary. Um, and, uh, and hence, you know, as I've kind of highlighted before, you know, the key is also to integrate the poor being the entrepreneurs and the communities that they benefit into the mainstream economy uh, through their local, through these kind of local actors and through the, you know, the, us using uh, the SMBA. And um, because we've seen, you know, a lot of times that there's a lack of institutional structures that include the poor as customers as beneficiaries. Um, we've seen that there's a lack of economic inclusion between the poor and these formal institutional players in the local economies to drive access to energy and those other basic services. Um, and there's also a, necess a necessity uh, from what we've seen in our field work 
to break the perception that the poor have no ability or willingness to pay for you know simple but highly critical clean energy technologies. They do. Um, generally, when we sit down with our entrepreneurs, um, it just means that the pay structure needs to be uh, different. It can't be on a monthly basis. It has to be on a daily basis, or it has to be on a weekly basis. Um, but that doesn't. But again, it it just means. But it still means that they are willing to pay for you know, an LED light to, as you can see in that picture there, to, to help with silk reeling. Uh, it can, you know, help um, pay for, you know, a micro hydro system that's going to uh, aid in providing lighting, uh, mobile charging, um, and, and also, you know, kind of this unintended benefit of kind of irrigation. Um, the poor are willing to pay for all of these, you know, innovative technologies. Um, it's just the case that, you know, they're not being provided the right products or the right services by these formal players in order to access them. And so s 3 is trying to drive this, not just in India, but in the other countries that we work in um, and across the, you know, through, across the world through networks that we're participating in uh, to do that. Um, and I know I'm kind of tight on time, so I don't want to take up too much more time, but here's just some uh, examples of our work um, that, I wanted, that I wanted to kind of highlight you know, s 3 we work in, you know, urban and rural areas, um, multiple states in India. Um, and uh, the big thing is, you know, every single community is different. Um, uh, there's, you know, numerous uh, concepts uh, to discuss. You know, we've, uh, as I've kind of stated, you know, we've had, we've done uh, microhydro projects in the Western Ghats, for example, to help create energy services and create this uh, unintended benefit for agriculture and irrigation by controlling the flow of runoff water coming down from the Western Ghats. The first time we actually did this project a number of years ago, it, when we found this benefit, um, we immediately kind of revamped our uh, project concept, went to another community very close by, and were able to actually fine tune, go to the technology supplier and fine tune the product that was being used, the system. Um, thereby giving the entrepreneur and, as a result, the community a, another incentive to kind of participate, reap the benefits of this. Um, a lot of times, um, though mobile uh, technology has been really prevalent, um, you know, across the developing world, we've, we've also found that providing a door-to-door -door service in a lot of the enterprises uh, really works. And you can see the bottom right picture, uh, one of our entrepreneurs uh, going across, going around in a peri-urban market in Bangalore. Uh, providing uh, renewable energy lighting to street hawkers and vendors so that they can work later into the night, extend their business hours, uh, raise their incomes as a result. While the entrepreneur raises his, his income, he's able to you know, pay for extra lighting, go to you know, expand, expand markets, um, hire you know, a couple more people. Um, but just a simple addition of you know, providing this door-to-door -door service and collecting daily payments instead of monthly payments really goes a long way to address some of the concerns that the poor have in creating energy access um, and, and kind of solving the issues that they, that they have had. Um, as I've said, you know, it, granting energy access should not be restricted to urban versus rural versus, you know, peri-urban areas. s 3 idf we've worked in kind of all of those areas and we've seen that while all of them have different challenges, um, you know, we, we do recognize uh, Kind of the re uh, the benefits um, and the poor in uh, and poor communities in all of those areas, you know, still have you know a set of demands um, related to. We would like you know energy and we would like lighting for for the evening. We would like you know cl clean cooking solutions. We would like um, you know mobile charging uh, stations set up. You know what kind of enterprise can provide us this? Um, and, you know, as I kind of said initially at the beginning of my presentation, you know, apart from creating, granting energy access purely, um, s 3 has kind of gone beyond in situations where energy access is provided, but um, to provide other basic services for the poor. And this can, you know, relate to water sanitation, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, uh, ICT, livelihoods, and others. So that the poor have access to these services. They're able to climb out of poverty. They're able, again, to connect with these formal institutional players integrate themselves into the local economy and become a kind of self-perpetuating uh, mini-economy, as it were, um, but cooperating with, but, but able to grow uh, out of, you know, uh, 
um, greater than the than the amount that they were that they were doing previously. Um, I think I'm I think I'm running out of time, so I just want to end it there. Um, I've left my email address uh, for anyone on the uh, webinar in case they want to get in touch. Um, again, really really thank Gaurav, really thank um, Engineering for Change for this opportunity, and I will give it back to him. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I found it to be very, very insightful and um, great work that you're doing there uh, in India primarily. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce another entrepreneur doing uh, wonderful work in the space of what I would call financial inclusion or access to both finance and energy, um, Leslie uh, Marincola. Uh, Leslie is the founder and CEO of Angaza, uh, a, a B2B, leading, uh, B2B provider of pay-as-you-go energy technology that enables off-grid families and emerging markets to purchase solar energy through affordable payments spread over time. Uh, Leslie has a bachelor's and master's in product design from Stanford University and has uh, been recognized by uh, many organizations, including uh, Business Week, as a rising uh, star in the entrepreneurial community. Um, her vision is to solve the world's most widespread problems like energy poverty with market-driven technology innovation. And uh, Leslie, I will hand off to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Gaurav. I'm going to steal the presenter ball from you. Perfect. All right, thank you. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Um, thank you for Engineering for Change for inviting me to speak today. Um, dive right in. All right, as Gaurav mentioned, my name is Leslie Marinkola and I'm the CEO of Angaza. Um, we're a for-profit business based in both San Francisco and Nairobi, Kenya, working to increase access to solar energy in underserved off-grid markets, particularly East Africa and India. Um, and we do this through innovative end-user financing technology, which you'll hear me talk a lot about. Before I dive too deep into what we're working on, I just want to make sure you have a context of the off-grid energy market. Um, we've already heard a bit about this on the webinar thus far, so I won't go too deep, but um, definitely want to paint this picture for you because this is the um, act of burning kerosene for light every night. That is literally the only option for over a billion people around the world. Um, kerosene is a very expensive energy option. It's very dim, toxic, dangerous. It's led to a lot of fires from open flames. Um, basically, we are focused on transitioning families off of kerosene to solar um, in very sustainable, scalable ways. The other sort of picture that is very common around um, off-grid markets is the use of cell phones. And I'm not talking about iPhones. These are usually what, what are called feature phones. Um, like you see in the picture here. Um, and many off-grid families are relying on these mobile phones both to keep in touch with family, but also to conduct business. Um, so they're very important. And actually sort of surprising, about 85% of the world now is covered by a mobile network. Um, so it's, it's particularly hard now to find areas that do not have some sort of cell phone signal. Um, it may be intermittent, it may not be super reliable, um, but the world is becoming more and more connected. Um, I want to highlight a couple differences between Africa and India, which I think are particularly interesting. You just heard Nicole talk a lot about the energy challenges in India. Um, we work some in India, uh, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so a couple of differences here. Um, you can see here the numbers from 2011, about 120 million homes off-grid in Sub-Saharan Africa and about 80 million homes off-grid in India. But if you look at the expert projections out through 2030, you'll see that the number in India is dropping to about 30 million off-grid homes, whereas the number of off-grid homes in Sub-Saharan Africa has grown to 130 million. Um, so why is this? Well, a couple different reasons. Um, India has um, more extensive grid power, and it's actually um, being extended faster than Africa. Um, India has a larger number of government incentives that are actually promoting clean energy solutions. And India tends to um, have higher density of population clusters, um, which means you can get uh, energy access to a larger number of, of people within a smaller geographic area. Um, so in Africa, much of the expected energy access progress will actually be offset by population growth, um, whereas the opposite is expected in India. Um, so that's sort of an interesting 
forecast of the future. Um, a couple other differences to note, um, kerosene subsidies are actually more prevalent in India than they are in Africa, um, which is very important when you have to consider the cost of solar and how solar competes against kerosene. It's actually harder for solar to compete in India because of these kerosene subsidies. Um, the existence or lack thereof of mobile money platforms is very important. Um, mobile money tends to be a lot more uh, prevalent and adopted at the end user level in East Africa um, than it is in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and India. And this is important when you're thinking about in the context of pay-as-you-go solar, which I'll talk a lot about, um, how you're actually collecting these recurring solar payments. Is it through cash or is it through mobile money? Um, and then another key difference between these regions is really just what percentage of the population has access to a bank account. Um, there's a much larger unbanked population throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, which actually means that mobile money in India is um, less needed because a larger percentage of the population has access to a bank account. So these are just a couple differences between the regions I thought it would be interesting to highlight because this really affects um, how you price and deliver pay-as-you-go solar in, in the various regions. So let's zoom down to a typical East African family. Um, these numbers are representative of East Africa, not necessarily um, other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa or India. But your typical East African family will spend over $100 per year on kerosene fuel. Um, this is often up to 20% of their income. It's crazy. <laughs> um, but the key is that they're not spending all of this at one time. They're literally buying kerosene by the liter, maybe every several days or every week, um, and when they have disposable cash. So this is very um, sporadic expenditure and small amounts over time. If you look at the entire um, global energy expenditures on fuel-based lighting, it's about $30 billion per year. Um, so that means these 1.2 billion people who are off-grid are spending $30 billion per year to buy kerosene. It's a big number made up of <laughs> a large population spending small amounts of money. So solar makes a lot of sense for these markets. Um, you heard Nicole talk about this already. Um, why does solar make so much sense? Well, a lot of these markets uh, live in sort of dispersed uh, areas um, with low density. Um, so it really doesn't make a lot of sense to extend the power grid out into a lot of these rural regions. Um, but solar provides distributed energy solution um, where you can even provide it at a household level. Um, these days, solar, LED, battery technology, it's all becoming more efficient, more robust. The cost is coming down. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a great time <laughs> to deliver solar to these markets, as long as you can make it financially accessible to the end user. So I want to talk a little bit more about the market growth here, um, because I think it's very important to um, consider how solar is going to work at scale in a sustainable way. Um, for all the companies involved that are trying to deliver solar, the manufacturers, the distributors, the sales agents who might be local entrepreneurs selling solar products to the end user, and also making financial sense for the end user. So in the short term, um, experts like the World Bank, IFC, estimate that um, it's about a $2.7 billion annual solar lantern market if all these companies were able to sell solar lanterns to every household that's currently dependent on kerosene. And what does that mean? If you can sell solar lanterns to all of these off-grid households, you can actually um, save over $27 billion per year um, by ceasing those kerosene purchases. That's a huge amount of money that these families can save by switching to solar. Just projecting this out a bit in the medium and longer term, um, it's estimated at over $50 billion market opportunity when you're looking at the solar energy that can be delivered to these rural populations, as well as the appliances that go along with having energy, charging or powering lights, charging cell phones, powering radios. But if you look at the market today, um, it's estimated that only $200 million of this market have actually been tapped. Um, this is a tiny drop in the bucket compared to the size of the market. And we believe out in Gaza that this is really due to the lack of end-user financing for solar, which is really just pre preventing the proliferation of solar energy solutions. So this is what I'm about to talk a lot about. So as I said, solar makes a lot of sense, but you have to price it correctly. Um, you can actually make solar cheaper than kerosene 
by spreading out the payments over time. And the beauty of this is you can, and you can make it a no-brainer to make the switch from kerosene to solar because you can actually spend less money on a per week basis for solar. We call this kind of financing pay as you go solar. <laughs> it's exactly like what it sounds. And this is pretty similar to purchasing airtime um, in small amounts as you use it. It's the same concept for solar. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, pay-as-you-go supply chain um, because there's multiple players um, at work here that make this work. Uh, manufacturers, these are um, like actually Garv's company, for example, One Degree Solar. Um, these are designers and manufacturers of um, might be portable solar lights, solar home systems, um, any combination of energy plus storage which are often selling through their own distribution networks or through third-party distributors. Uh, distributors take sort of all shapes and sizes. Um, most of them tend to sell through networks of either sales agents or small vendors. Um, and the reason for that is these sales agents and vendors are usually co-located in the regions that they're actually selling. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the end user in this supply chain. Um, so most pay-as-you-go companies are actually vertically integrated and span this entire supply chain where they're manufacturing their own products, distributing them, providing the after-sales support uh, to end users. Um, Angaza operates a little bit differently, though. Um, like I said in the beginning, we're a technology company. We design the pay-as-you-go technology, and we sell that technology to third-party manufacturers and third-party distributors who actually want to offer pay-as-you-go products. Um, the reason we have this B2B approach is we want to allow our partners to continue to focus on their core businesses, um, usually manufacturing or distribution, um, and offer them pay-as-you-go in a fraction of the time, not a fraction of the cost, because it's ready, um, up and running from day one. Um, so I'm sure there are a lot of technically-minded folks on this webinar, since it is the Engineering for Change webinar. Um, so I want to dig a little bit deeper into our technology and break it down, break our platform down into the three main components that have to be in place to have a functioning, scalable pay platform. The three main components are embedded pay as technology, which is essentially a hardware and firmware that you embed into a solar product to have two functions. Um, one, this embedded technology actually meters the energy output so you can deactivate the product if the customer hasn't prepaid. Um, the other function of the embedded technology is to actually make that product connected to the cloud. So it can both receive new payment information as the end user makes these recurring payments, and it can also, in some cases, send back um, information to the cloud. So it can send back usage and diagnostic information. So distributors can actually know exactly how their customers are using these products. Um, so manufacturers, like I said in the supply chain before, our manufacturers are particularly interested in this embedded pay as technology because they need to put this into their products to make them talk to the cloud. Um, the distributors in this picture are particularly um, concerned about having a web interface. This is basically a cloud-based software platform or a portal where they can log in and track all their customers, see all their, re their repayments over time, essentially manage their entire loan portfolio. What's really interesting about pay as technology, though, is it's connecting all these solar products that previously were unconnected. Um, before pay as technology existed, a lot of solar products were being sold, and distributors never had any follow-up with customers and really didn't know if the products were continue to function or be used. Um, but pay as technology is really changing that and adding a lot of transparency into these distribution channels. And then the third bucket you have that, that sales agents are particularly um, concerned about is having some sort of portal um, on a, a mobile phone, which might be a low-end Android smartphone, um, but some portal to really track their, their end customers um, and just track them on a very granular basis to know who's late on payment or who uh, needs, needs to make a payment. Um, so we provide a mobile app as well that allows these sales agents to really run their own businesses and selling pay as products and processing payments. Okay, I'm going to go a little faster here because I'm running out of time, but um, I want to talk just quickly about three different embedded technologies that you can actually use within solar products to meter the energy output and connect them, connect them to the cloud, like I mentioned. Um, these are the three primary technologies that Angaza offers. 
And the reason we offer three is I think it's important to understand that, that not one technology is going to work for every type of product, every size of product, and in every market. Um, there's a lot of different factors and decision points that go into choosing an embedded technology. Um, there's definitely cost trade-offs. You can get an embedded technology that, that adds as little as only 20 cents to the cost of a product versus if you're going GSM, it might add $20 to the cost of the product. Um, so one solution which might work for a small portable lantern won't work for a large solar home system. There's also certain trade-offs about whether you want to get that, that data transfer back from the product. Do you want to track exactly how much light a customer is using versus how much energy? Do you want to be able to provide remote customer support by knowing, for example, how much solar energy is, is being used to charge the battery? Um, and those, those tend to have cost uh, trade-offs as well. Um, just quickly in terms of the end customer experience here, um, this cable base is very low cost technology. You're actually leveraging a mobile phone that usually the sales agent carries um, to act as a data connection between the product and the cloud. Um, with a keypad scenario, this middle scenario that you see here, um, this is sort of more of a customer independent solution, but it doesn't have the ability to get data back from the product because you're actually receiving a code and typing that code directly into a keypad on the product or a remote that ships with the product. Um, and then on the high end, like I mentioned, you can actually embed a GSM module directly into a product to get it to be constantly cloud connected. Um, but this really is only restricted to areas that have the mobile coverage um, to be able to um, support this uh, constant data connection. Um, but like I said in the beginning, this is about 85% of the world right now. Um, this software platform, I, I'd say, is um, really the brains of the operation. Um, it's how these distributors are registering new customers, entering customer information, tracking their payments as they're making their weekly solar payments. Um, you can see here an image of um, one particular product where we track different brightness levels that the customer is using of the product. And it's interesting because you can actually see um, how the usage of the product correlates to expected repayment behavior and really focus in on certain sales channels that might not be optimized. Um, and then uh, last but definitely not least, um, like I mentioned, is the mobile app. And I really think sales agents are the link in the supply chain, which is basically make, making or breaking the success of pay-as-you-go. Um, why is that? Well, the sales agent's responsible for finding new customers, for registering new customers, most importantly, for training new customers. Um, these customers need to understand how to use a solar product, um, but they also need to understand um, how to use the Pageo technology so they can easily make their weekly payment for solar and have their product activate correctly. Um, so delivering that customer education is one of the most important, uh, important jobs of the sales agent. Um, but like I said um, in, in the beginning, I really believe that pay-as-you-go technology can only scale, um, or sorry, pay-as-you-go um, as a business business model can only scale if you have technology in place because these sales agents need a way to just understand um, the, the payment status of their customers and be able to process payments. This is interesting in um, some markets, like India, for example, where mobile money is not as prevalent the sales agents are actually collecting cash payments on a weekly basis and remitting those cash payments back to the headquarters of the distributors often. So you need to track you know, where cash is in the system, how much cash has a single agent collected, and how uh, when and, and how much have they remitted back to the distributor. And finally, I'll just leave you um, with a couple, couple thoughts about the role of data-driven distribution. I've alluded to the fact that with pay-as-you-go technology in place in a lot of these products, you can now um, get usage and diagnostic data back from the products. Um, what pay-as-you-go is also doing is it's uh, allowing distributors to have long-term relationships with their customers. Um, a customer, for example, might buy an entry-level solar light, um, make on-time payments for that light, and get a certain credit history within Nongaza's platform. The distributor can then use that credit history and really understand the financial risk they would be taking to then extend a 10-watt or 100-watt loan to that same customer. And it really helps customers just increase their energy access over time by forming these credit histories within the system. Um, so how does data-driven distribution work? Well, it's 
sort of a three-stage process um, as you collect more and more data in the system. Um, definitely a lot of individual user data is being collected, especially the phone number of the customer. The phone number is very important so <laughs> the distributor can have direct access to the customer. Um, and once you get a lot of individual user data um, collected, you can actually aggregate this user, user data and improve your sales and marketing, um, increase sales agent effectiveness because you know which sales agents um, are, are selling products um, and really analyze your entire loan portfolio and repayment. Um, and then even zooming out even more, um, this is something Angaza is really excited about, is just creating this global database. Um, we'll be putting you know, millions of customers on the map with a digital identity for the first time. And having that kind of identity will allow a lot of these off-grid customers who might not have previously had bank accounts to actually have these sort of credit scores and access more traditional financing. Um, and this is really where we come full circle to um, just the work that uh, we do with financial inclusion. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. And I think it's time for Q&A. I'll hand it back to Gaurav. Perfect. Thank you, Leslie. Um, I'm just sealing the ball back. Um, so thank you both. Uh, we have about 10 or 12 minutes left for Q&A from the audience. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can see on the bottom right of your screen, I believe there should be a small uh, Q&A tab. Uh, if there are any questions for either of the presenters, uh, please feel free to send them along uh, there. And um, Yana and I will uh, select a short list to relate, relate to the presenters. Um, Yana, I'm not sure if you have any particular questions in mind that you would like to ask, but uh, one that I would have for, uh, for Nicole, I, I think uh, Leslie's presentation was a bit more in, in depth. So uh, Nicole, I would love to learn a bit more about how um, payments are collected uh, in your model, uh, whether that's through mobile, mobile money or uh, cash or some other um, method, and maybe why or why not, you know, why you're using certain methods over others. Yeah, thanks, Gaurav, uh, for that question. And um, yeah, apologies, I couldn't go into it. I just wanted to make sure uh, I was okay with time. Um, but very quickly, um, short answer, all of the above. It just depends on the type of enterprise that we're working with and the, uh, the entrepreneur that we're working with and what, quote, unquote, infrastructure they have at the time. Uh, so we've had certain, we've generally seen in urban areas, for example, mobile money uh, or, you know, kind of, cash light uh, methods are more in use uh, when it comes to paying loans back to banks or paying loans back to MFIs. In the rural areas, generally we've seen um, our you know, product partners or um, our um, other, other different types of organizations that we work with, i.e. NGOs or, uh, or the like, directly communicating with the entrepreneur and the bank and acting as kind of a go-between or an intermediary um, kind of agent, collecting via cash or collecting or working at an arrangement um, that, that helps in that regard. Um, kind of a short answer to that question, but we've, we've really seen that mobile money is, is very much in use. As Leslie pointed out, um, it is uh, the case where a lot of um, you know, those in India uh, will be banked uh, either now or in the future um, or connected to a financial institution of some sort, but that, um, but the payment collection method still will be evolving uh, in terms of, um, you know, how payments are collected, when they're collected, um, through whom, um, and, and the like. Uh, thank you. And uh, w one more follow-up for Nicole. There were some questions coming in, but um, uh, what sort of information has been collected from uh, from your clients uh, in India? Is it purely financial, uh, or is, is there uh, any sort of developmental uh, impact measurement or things of that nature that you're uh, also assessing? Yeah, happy to answer that. Um, so generally when we're... Um, kind of doing our initial kind of scoping uh, on a new landscape or a new community. We inspect uh, financial, social, uh, economic, all different types of indicators regarding selecting an entrepreneur as well as uh, inspecting the community. So we do look at, you know, 
average household size, average income, you know, um, list of occupations for uh, the residents there, um, any connections they may have to formal institutions of any type. Um, in terms of uh, kind of social indicators, we do look at, you know, um, education levels, uh, percentage of those going to school, um, kind of a summary of needs that the community needs uh, in terms of basic services. We take all this information, and, and I'm happy um, to go kind of offline and present, you know, talk about the indicators more specifically, um, you know, time permitting. Um, and we sit down with all of these kind of indicators, social, economic, and uh, financial, um, as well as environmental relating to, you know, what kinds of technologies they use now. Uh, Leslie kind of highlighted kerosene. Um, we, we encounter that quite regularly, uh, especially in a lot of the lighting enterprises that we help foster. Uh, and we come up with an enterprise concept that will work uh, or will kind of substitute and eliminate some of these and mitigate some of these kind of financial, social, um, and, uh, and, and environmental um, concerns that, that this community has. So again, you know, just relating back to my, pres my part of the presentation, our work is not only to formally integrate um, the poor into the uh, economy, but also um, kind of rid them of, you know, reliance on traditional fossil fuels and, and uh, you know, systems that, you know, clearly um, will keep them trapped in a cycle of dependency. Right, absolutely. And uh, just to shift back to, back to Leslie for, uh, for one of the questions from the audience, uh, Rachel had asked, uh, Leslie, what do you see as the largest challenges, technical or otherwise, uh, currently facing pay as you go solar or maybe uh, elaborating uh, on those challenges in the future that you foresee? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd say the single biggest challenge right now is just the financing that distributors need to have in place to finance the pay-as-you-go inventory as the end user is actually paying back the product. Um, the financing burden is much larger the larger systems that you go. Um, just to give you concrete examples here, a small portable solar light might have a payback period ranging from four to eight weeks. Um, larger solar home systems might be as long as one year or even up to three years, depending on the size of the system. So someone's got to finance that product um, as these micropayments are being made over time. Um, so I'd say that's sort of the largest universal um, barrier right now to pay-as-you-go solar. Um, but it's also interesting, uh, and this is particularly because Angaza works in a B2B context. We work with a lot of different types of distributors. Um, we're seeing a, a challenge for distributors who have traditionally been selling cash-based solar products to then transition to selling pay-as-you-go products. And it's a very different um, sort of operational challenge um, because you're actually running a credit facility within your business. You're turning into a microfinance institution. Um, and this is definitely um, a challenge for a lot of traditional solar distributors to, to make the switch operationally to support that kind of credit. And what have you seen as solutions in that case, just to add on to that question for, uh, for a moment? Uh, what have you seen as solutions? Is that the manufacturer providing um, the trainings or a firm like Gaza or a local you know, NGO or CSO? Or Yeah, we actually provide training to, to help with that um, barrier. Uh, basically, the training um, is, you know, simple things like uh, making sure the distributor is running a helpline because now they're going to, um, it's not just a one-time sale to a customer. They're going to be getting questions from customers over the lifetime of the payment period. Um, and then it's more complex things like thinking about cash flow for their business. Um, how much inventory do they want to buy? When do they expect to get repaid from that page you go inventory? And when does that mean that they can purchase another container of products? Um, so yeah, right now we play the majority of that role with, with training distributors. Got it. Okay. And uh, one question from, uh, from Emerson. Uh, are there any past success stories uh, or project examples where pay-as-you-go energy um, has uh, sounds like been the segue to, uh, for more technology solutions, um, whether it's mobile money or other hardware technology? Uh, that's thank you to, to, to Leslie, you, you again. Um, yeah, so hopefully I'm answering this question correctly. Um, this is a great example of how pay-as-you-go 
Solar has actually given reason to a lot of end users to adopt mobile money, um, whereas before they might not have really had a direct reason to use it. Um, so distributors who are selling Pageo product, products are often rolling up end user education about the use of mobile money into their training. Um, so, so customers are actually using mobile money for the first time. And I think this is interesting because mobile money um, started basically as a way to send money from urban areas back to rural areas, which, which was creating an actual transfer of cash such that there was a lot of cash being withdrawn from rural mobile money agents. With pay as you go though, it's actually helping the mobile money system because you've got rural customers putting cash into rural agents and sending that money back to urban areas where the distributor headquarter might be located. So it's sort of reversing the transfer of, or the flow of, of money in that system. Um, sort of an interesting side note there. <laughs> And, uh, and Jana, Jana, we have about two minutes left, so uh, feel free to either take the mic or uh, there's, there are a few more questions coming in, uh, but we have about one, one or two minutes left. Sure. So actually, I'm going to pose a question uh, to Nicole uh, for SBIDF. Uh, if you could speak perhaps to the typical engagement period that you, uh, the amount of time that you spend uh, with an entrepreneur um, developing their business, uh, providing training, and essentially getting them uh, to to operate uh, effectively. Do you do you have you experienced a certain um, pattern of, of time investment? Yeah, sure. Um, again, uh, I say I give this answer pretty lightly because every single entrepreneur that we work with is different. Uh, but typically, we see about half a year to about 10 months um, in terms of engagement. Um, if we worked with a financial institution before and we're working with kind of a different branch, it really speeds up the process because of the fact that the financial institution is more willing uh, to work with s because of, you know, previous uh, kind of track record and um, uh, history of partnership. Uh, similarly, you know, when we work with, you know, a new technology supplier or distributor uh, company and we go to a new area with them, um, you know, it kind of quickens up the pace. Um, in terms of the entrepreneur, it always helps when we have a look, when we're working with a local organization like a CSO or maybe just in a more informal uh, community-based organization. Um, we have worked with, at least in the Indian context, we work with uh, the village-level um, kind of councils or the panchayats uh, before to identify entrepreneurs and help identify kind of the, uh, kind of the needs of the community. Um, and that really, really helps um, in kind of streamlining all and making, making that kind of timeline a little, little more efficient and a little more uh, uh, doable. Um, uh, sorry, I want to make sure I answered all parts of that question. Hopefully I did. Yeah, we can definitely, uh, I think that was a rich answer. And that's actually brought us to the end of our time. I'd like to thank all of our presenters. Thank you. And to our moderator, Gaurav, Leslie, Nicole, thank you for taking the time to, to spend with us today. And all of our attendees from around the world, thank you for attending. Uh, for those of you who are seeking uh, professional development hours, the code is included on the slide visible now for you to submit along with your request for the PH certificate. If we didn't tackle your questions or you have additional questions for the presenters, um, including job inquiries, please feel free to send us an email at webinars at engineeringforchange.org and sign up to get information on upcoming webinars. Next month we'll be covering standards. So we look forward to catching you on the next webinar. Thank you to all and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening wherever you may be. Take care.